as as is our our custom, I, I'll, I'll bring you the news from abroad, and and I will introduce the person who will introduce our speaker, uh, uh, Dan Bender, a member of our clinical faculty. And um, but I uh, so uh, in terms of uh, upcoming uh, lectures, I just wanted to highlight two in particular. One on the 16th of June. Um, which is uh, the uh, state of my state of the department ad address, and uh, I don't want to foreshadow anything, but it will be a little peppery this year. <laughs> so I think you'll find it entertaining. I hope so. Um, next week, uh, of course, is our our uh, annual awarding of the Seymour Lussman Research Residency Research Awards. Uh, to uh, and our recipients this year are Jungsun Cho, Adam Mecca, and Sam Wilkinson. So that should be really uh, should be great. That's always for me uh, one of the absolute highlights of the year, and and it's always striking to hear after four years in the residency the incredible things that people have accomplished uh, as uh, psychiatry residents. And and this year I know is no exception. And then on the so. Next week is Lussman Awards. The following week is, is the State of the Department Address. And then on the 23rd is our uh, graduation, residency graduation address. And uh, Kay Redfield Jameson, one of the most prominent uh, consumer advocates, psychiatry experts on bipolar disorder, creativity, and so many interesting things, will be giving the graduation address, which, which, uh, which will be, uh, again, uh, spectacular. I expect. Um, the, uh, in, in terms of, of what you've been reading about in the news, um, we have yet to have a state of Connecticut budget. Um, it, the, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans have not um, settled on a budget. Um, and there are a lot of things uh, at play, including the budget of the Connecticut Mental Health Center. Um, uh, as you probably know, uh, President Trump recommended a cut to the NIH budget. Uh, Congress overturned that. Uh, Trump has again, uh, President Trump has again uh, uh, proposed to cut the, uh, the NIH budget by uh, over 20 percent. Uh, and I have a few words to say about that, which I'll say for the President, State Department. Um, uh, you, you all know about the Affordable um, American Health Care Act being uh, deliberated in Congress. Uh, most uh, the Senate is, uh, looks like it's not going to be uh, endorsing the Republican uh, bill, but what they will endorse is a matter of mystery still. Um, very uh, contentious. We're waiting for it, it a version to come out of. Uh, uh, out of uh, the group of 13 Republican senators who are deliberating that, and, and I'll have a few words about that as well in the State of the Department address. Um, so there's a lot going on, and it's a very interesting and, and scary in some ways, but also so much interesting and exciting things that are emerging. Um, I, I will. Uh, we be waiting to see how some of these things turn out. Um, before I introduce Dr. Bender to introduce our speaker, I just wanted to, to say a few words about our speaker today since we've known each other for a long time and, and I've always been extraordinarily impressed by his work. Um, I think our fathers knew each other as well. <laughs> So we're, we're like second, continuing second generation friends. Uh, but our, our speaker today is one of the most innovative, creative people that I know in the field of psychiatry in, in terms of thinking about the problems that we face in psychiatry in new and, and creative ways that are really in important ways changing the way we think about the, the, what used to be called the mind-body problem. <laughs> in psychiatry, um, and uh, with some very important clinical implications. Um, since you're going to get an introduction, uh, more introduction, I'll, I'll, I will curtail my comments there, but except to say, that, David, I'm so pleased to have you here, and, and I wanted to 
I have you do Grand Rounds for a very long time, so I'm, I'm very pleased that you've come. So, Dan, why don't you introduce him? Uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have Dr. Spiegel uh, talking with us today. Uh, he began his intellectual journey here in New Haven, majoring in philosophy, and because of that, he had to take the terrifying physical chemistry uh, to increase his chances of getting into medical school. That's a course that absolutely terrified us more average uh, pre-meds. Um, but he did that, went to Harvard for medical school and residency, and then went to Stanford for a year, uh, a year's visit, check, and has been there 42 and counting. Uh, he has those uh, functions uh, at Stanford, and a further one that he has is the medical director of the Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, uh, he has been doing 40 years of clinical work and research experience studying hypnosis, psycho-oncology, stress and health, pain control, psychoneuroendocrinology, and sleep. He's past president of the American College of Psychiatrists and the Society for Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis and is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, I, I would like to emphasize that as I followed his research over the years, it's both empiric and whole body very relevant uh, to suffering human beings. A wonderful example of that is this book, uh, which he co-authored with his father in the second edition called Trance and Treatment. And those of you who wish to learn anything more about this under, grossly underutilized aspect, uh, treatment, uh, treatment technique, uh, would do well to, to get this book. It's incredibly clear. If anybody wants to look at it afterwards, you'll see all my underlinings and bracketings and so forth, which speaks to its clinical relevance. Um, he continues working to understand the uh, amazingly mysterious mechanisms involved in hypnosis. Um, I think, uh, as I said, we are extremely fortunate to have Dr. Spiegel talking with us today, so please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. I'm honored uh, to be here for many reasons. Uh, I admire the work of the Yale Department. Dan is a friend and classmate. I hate to admit it, but I'm also here for my 50th uh, reunion from Yale College. Um, and so it feels to me like coming home. And John Crystal, uh, I admire tremendously in the work of the department here at Yale. And the fact that we do have this common heritage of being the children of prominent psychiatrists. I knew his dad, Henry, and we, um, he, both of them are pioneers in the work on post-traumatic stress disorder, which is an area of interest of mine. My father was Herbert Spiegel, a psychiatrist who did pioneering work with hypnosis starting in World War II. My mother, Natalie Shanus, was also a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. So we said in my family that I was told by them that I was free to become any kind of psychiatrist I wanted to be. <laughs> and uh, I kind of took them, took them up on it, as did John, I guess. Um, but it's, it's fun to be, to be in that tradition. Although I was, I was telling Dan last night that um, when I started trying to use hypnosis at Mass Mental Health Center as a resident, I got interpretations about my transference problems. And, um, uh, you know, actually one of the reasons that I found myself wandering to California was that life was a lot freer and more open at the time to do something other than classical psychoanalysis, and it was empirical. So uh, in reflecting on my life, Yale taught me how to think. I took a course with Vince Scully. I, actually, I audited the course. I wish I'd taken it because he gave all the students A's. But <laughs> it was this brilliant course on art and architectural history. And what he taught you was that your reaction to a building or a painting is what is giving you information about what the, paint, the architect or painter was trying to do. So if you just inquire about your own experience, you will learn a lot about what is before you. And that taught me more about thinking than a lot of other things that I learned. And I, Yale's philosophy department was very strong in existential philosophy, which has served me well dealing with patients who are dying of cancer and other illnesses. So I'm very grateful uh, for the years I spent uh, here in New Haven and for colleagues and friends here. So what I'd like to do is share with you some of what we've learned about the brain-body problem. So I hope in the first part of this talk, 
to give you an idea of how we're trying to help cancer patients facing these existential issues, but also what we've learned about how what goes on in their brain affects what happens in their body. And then using, in the second part of my talk, hypnosis to help people manage some of those brain-body interactions, particularly involving pain. Um, in 2007, what was then called the Institute of Medicine um, issued a report saying that addressing psychosocial needs should be an integral part of quality cancer care and that evidence supports the effectiveness of services uh, relating to emotional distress and illnesses including cancer, depression, uh, depression and anxiety. Psychiatry has always been a kind of handmaiden to real medicine, and one of the things that said me as a psychiatrist is so few of us. You have some wonderful programs here, which I really admire, linking psychiatry into oncology and other aspects of medical practice, um, and um, it's something that is sorely needed, and where I think our heritage as physicians as well as doctors of the mind uh, needs to be activated more than it is. We know that cancer patients uh, cope with a host of very serious stressors. And one of our support groups, a patient of mine uh, who had been a Silicon Valley engineer until she had metastatic breast cancer and she knew that her odds of surviving uh, more than two years were not great. And she said, you know, uh, she was in her hospital bed. She said to me, I've been an engineer all my life. I've always wanted to be an artist. So she quit her job as an engineer, went to art school, and by the time she died, she was teaching people how to do art. And she brought in this dressmaker's maquette, um, redone to show what cancer and its treatment had done to her. And um, so she'd had a modified radical mastectomy, she had radiation burns, she had an open biopsy on the other breast, and she'd had a tram flap reconstruction. And it's a reminder that cancer patients live with the very tangible reminders of their illness every day of their lives. It's the kind of stress they have to deal with, and it's the kind of stress that we can actually help them with. But the story about stress and cancer goes long before people get cancer. So there, this is one example of a growing area in which people have been examining the effects of, of stress, stressors and stress-related mental disorders uh, on patients' risk of getting cancer. And um, this is a study done in Finland um, uh, some years ago, 10,000 subjects, and they looked at the, the effect of any event on the probability of developing breast cancer in the ensuing five years. And there's a significantly increased risk from any single event, major events like divorce, separation, or death of a family member, can raise the odds more than twofold of developing a cancer in the next five years. So there is plenty of evidence that stress response systems in the human brain can have an effect on not just how you cope with cancer, but on your risk of getting cancer. We did a, a retrospective study among women with metastatic breast cancer in which we studied the relationship between stress or traumatic stress and disease-free interval, which is the time from initial diagnosis to relapse. And we found a significant relationship between the severity of life stressors and the speed with which the cancer developed. And disease-free interval um, is um, a proxy for ultimate survival time. And so uh, if you have shorter time from diagnosis to relapse, you'll have shorter survival, overall survival time. So there's evidence once you have cancer that trauma and stress history is related to disease progression. He's saying stress is killing you. Uh, you need an easier job, a smaller house, and a different family. <laughs> and in fact, Social support, and many of us don't realize this, is a very potent uh, either risk or protection factor. So this started uh, with work in the 60s uh, showing that social integration is associated with survival. Um, this is a review that was published by James House in Science uh, showing that the relationship, that the more socially integrated you are, uh, the lower your overall risk of mortality. The, the strength of this relationship across studies is as strong as the link between smoking and survival. And yet we tend, I mean, that's our domain, we tend not to think about the importance of social support in relationship to survival. This is overall survival, um, but this is a very interesting study that came out of Dana-Farber a few years ago in which they examined a five-year cohort of SEER uh, cancer patients um, and looked at the, a simple question, is being married um, related to survival time? With, and what they found was that for all 10 cancers, 
uh, you had longer survival by an average of four months um, if you were married than if you were not. Um, independent of, and, and they looked for control variables. You would think, well, people who are married maybe get diagnosed sooner because their wives nag them to, you know, go see the doctor, or they may get more effective treatment because they have more social and financial resources. Those were true, but even when you controlled for that, you still got just a pure marriage effect on cancer survival. And what the most shocking thing about this paper was that in the abstract in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, they said that the effect of marital status is as great as the effect of chemotherapy on overall cancer survival, which is about four months, that's all. Now, there are some cancers like Hodgkin's that are cured with chemotherapy and radiotherapy, but there are many others where the chemo effect is rather modest. And so we need to keep in mind that social connection and all of the psychosocial benefits that come with it uh, have an effect not just on quality of life, but on quantity of life. Another example, one that we're all familiar with, is depression. Um, and the level of depression has been shown, Wayne Caton and others have shown, that um, the more serious your medical illness, the more likely you are to be diagnosed with depression. So it's 12% of medical inpatients. And uh, I don't think in your consultation service there are in ours, we're asked to see 12% of all inpatients for anything, let alone for depression. But in fact, it's a very common disorder uh, among these patients. Among the terminally ill, 20%, uh, 60% among those who request assisted suicide, which ought to give us pause uh, when we do stupid things like in California and pass a law that allows for assisted suicide, but that's another, another talk. In looking at cancer progression, there is very clear evidence that depression is a comorbid risk factor. We've tended to think about this more uh, in relationship to cardiovascular disease, I think in part because you can just sort of picture the autonomic nervous system wiring its way down to the heart and affecting heart function, but it also has a comparable effect on cancer. Fifteen of 24 studies show a relationship between depression and um, cancer progression. Uh, this is a study we published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, uh, and what you see here is the course of depression, so worsening or improving depression in the baseline year here is a long-term predictor of breast cancer survival. Uh, so if the breast cancer, if the depression was decreasing, cancer survival over the ensuing 10 years is a lot longer than it is, significantly longer than if your depression is getting worse here. And this means that it's not proximate, so it's not that you get really depressed two months before you die. This is a decade before we can predict um, survival. So it means that chronic and severe depression uh, is a risk factor for cancer progression. So what can we do about that? Well, there are many potential therapeutic opportunities. All of the biological and psychosocial interventions we have for treating depression might plausibly have an effect not just on reducing depression, but potentially affecting survival as well. Um, and uh, this is one, uh, one uh, this is only the only psychopharmacology I'll present here. This is the uh, New Jersey Turnpike, I think you would understand that. Um, so one approach we developed, uh, Irv Yalom, uh, my mentor and friend, uh, recruited me to Stanford in the mid-70s, and he asked me, he called me up uh, after a, I was there for like half a year and said, I'm running this group of women who are dying of breast cancer, would you like to co-lead it with me? And when the world's authority on group psychotherapy asks if you'll co-lead a group, you think for a second and you say yes. So. I learned a tremendous amount. He's a wonderful therapist as well. He, you know, some people who write well about how to do therapy don't actually do it that well. He's really good at what he does. And the idea was the existential idea that I picked up here at Yale, that the only way you live authentically is by facing the contingency of, of life, facing the possibility of non-being. And in fact, the idea of this group was that we could help women not just not be as depressed or anxious, but actually to live in a deeper, more authentic way, that it could be a, a, a period of improvement in life. And many of the patients I've worked with in these groups tell me um, that my life has never been the same since I got cancer, but in many ways it's better. And uh, they trivialize the trivial. They, they manage their lives in totally different ways. And so we started, and, and yet we were warned by oncologists that it was a bad thing to do that you know, the 50% survival rate was two years with metastatic breast cancer, they would demoralize one another. And so we were very anxious about doing this initially. 
And if you think about it, though, death is not a novel idea to a cancer patient. You know, although now more than half of all people diagnosed with cancer will live to die of something else, actually uh, more women with breast cancer die of heart disease than they do of breast cancer, which tells you how much better we're getting at treating cancer. But it also tells you that, that the existential issues go far beyond cancer, and cancer patients know that. Um, and in fact, if you deprive them of contact with others coping with the disease, you deprive them of learning means of coping with the threat of the illness. So we developed a supportive expressive group psychotherapy. We created new bonds of social connection, encouraged the expression of emotion. And when we did this, there was a lot of pop psychology about, you know, from victim to victor, that if you think the cancer might get you, it will get you. And it was a really bad model of mind-body issues in cancer, because the idea was if you just don't think about it, it won't happen, which is nonsense. And we did the opposite. We said, think about it, face your mortality, deal with your anger, fear, and sadness, and you'll get through it, come out on the other side, and do better with it, which is pretty much what we found. We encouraged them to deal directly with fears of dying and death. We grieve losses in the group. Um, they reordered their life priorities, as, as this first patient I mentioned to you did. Um, we encouraged them to communicate more clearly with doctors, and we used hypnosis for symptom management, which I'll talk about a little later. Uh, we wrote this book on the supportive expressive approach, group therapy for cancer patients. Uh, and the idea in managing this kind of existential distress is, oddly enough, to convert anxiety into fear and depression into sadness. Anxiety, you're just generally miserable and frightened and you don't know why, so there's nothing you can do about it. And a lot of this poor stress response has to do with the inability to conceptualize a means of coping with whatever the stimulus is that's making you uncomfortable. And in the same way, if you're just depressed, you're mostly feeling hopeless, helpless, and worthless. You're not grieving losses or dealing with issues that would genuinely sensibly make you sad. And that makes it just harder to cope with it. So that's the kind of thing we did in the group. Shakespeare, of course, said it best. He, the best. he said, give sorrow words, the grief that does not speak, whispers the off fraud heart, and bids it break. Um, we found in these weekly 90-minute sessions that we actually reduced their tendency to suppress emotion. There are a lot of randomized trials showing relationships with distress and anxiety and depression, but I think this is the first one to show that we actually changed their emotion management strategy uh, to make them less likely to suppress emotion. And this actually mediated the reduction in anxiety and depression. So if you're more directly open about your anger, fear, and sadness at the time, over time, you find that you become less anxious and depressed. And they actually felt that they had more self-efficacy in managing their emotion, even though they were less over-controlling of it. So it became a major psychotherapeutic mechanism. It's why we called it supportive expressive group psychotherapy. Uh, here's an example. When one member of the group died, another wrote uh, these little cards that she circulated. Dear Eva, whenever the wind is from the sea, salty and strong, you are here, remembering your zest for hilltops and the sturdy surf of your laughter, gentles my grief at your going and tempers the thought of my own. And another woman wrote that being in the group is like looking into the Grand Canyon when you're afraid of heights. You knew if you fell down it would be a disaster, but nonetheless you feel better about yourself because I'm able to look at it. I can't say I feel serene, but I can look at it. And we watch that happen every week in these groups. Well, at the outcome of this randomized trial, we found that the women who participated in the groups became less anxious and depressed. The control patients actually got more anxious and depressed. It's what you would hope for in a psychotherapy trial. We managed to replicate this in a replication study 15 years later. So it's pretty clear that dealing with these feelings directly improves psychological outcome. Um, this is a Cochrane database review of psychotherapy in advanced cancer, and it showed a significant overall effect of psychotherapy, even in this very difficult medical and psychiatric setting, and I'm glad to say that two of our studies were part of this uh, review. Um, so why don't we do more of it? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. McConnell, your insurance plan only provides for empathetic nodding and a sad and downward glance. There's a $200 copay for any additional words of compassion, not to exceed 40 words or three expressions of sympathy or condolence. Uh, I don't know what to say, and as Dr. Crystal mentioned, um, the future is looking a little bleak. One statistic I would like to share with you about how irrational this current situation is, is that the hated, inefficient, horrible government health care system, Medicare, that pays for care of the sickest and oldest people in the country, you know what their overhead rate for managing health care is? Anybody want to guess? Sorry? 
I heard a number? 3%. 2.7, you're right. Now, let's take the slick, mean, competitive private insurance industry. Many, much of it is headquartered within a few hundred miles of here. Um, you know what their overhead rate is? 50%. Sorry? 150. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Will. <laughs> close, close. 27%. So Medicare is 10 times more efficient in managing healthcare dollars than private insurance. We actually spend in this country more on insurance companies than we do on doctors. So you want to solve the healthcare problem, you get Medicare for everybody, and you eliminate instantly about a quarter of overall healthcare costs, which is a huge amount of money. Is that going to happen anytime soon? I don't know, but it's something to think about. Um, so. The next question, obviously, I'm, I'm leading you to examine the issue of, well, what do we do that might actually have an effect on survival time? And um, I was reviewing the work that I just presented to you in the 70s, and uh, there was a lot of this wish away your cancer kind of thinking. And so I thought, you know, I have an experiment I hadn't initially planned on. Why don't I just find out what happened to the patients who were enrolled in the randomized trial? And we did. We got survival outcome, actually, on all of the patients in the study. And what you see that was quite shocking to me was that by 48 months after the study had begun, all of the control patients had died and a third of the treatment group were still alive. There was a median difference in survival of 18 months. And we went back, I, you know, I, I, I recalculated this by hand. This was early in the computer era and I just didn't want to have some glitch explain it, so I did it by hand. This was the difference we found. We looked at whether they had gotten different kinds of treatment, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, they were just beginning hormonal treatments then, no differences to account for it. So we published this in The Lancet in 1989, and it aroused a fair amount of attention because we were raising the question that if you don't do appropriate emotional care for cancer patients, you're not only not helping them live better, you may actually not be doing what is adequately necessary medical care uh, to help them live as long as possible. We tried to replicate this study uh, 15 years later. We did not find an overall effect, but we found a significant interaction for women with ER negative cancers. And we think the reason is that um, there was a tremendous drop in mortality from breast cancer in that era because of the introduction of aromatase inhibitors and selective estrogen response modulators that were changing ER positive breast cancer survival but not ER negative breast cancer survival. So the ER negative patients had the same effect of psychotherapy that we saw in the earlier study. Barbara Anderson at Ohio State published a study for women with primary <coughs> breast cancer intervening and showing reduced rates of relapse and longer survival for women who got group psychotherapy. Uh, Jennifer Temmel at Mass General did a randomized trial of palliative care for men and women with non-small cell lung cancer. She significantly reduced their depression and anxiety, and they lived significantly longer, two and a half months longer, in the palliative care setting where they're actually encouraging people to stop chemotherapy, and she got a survival effect. Overall, um, there are nine studies that show a significant effect of psychotherapy on survival for cancer patients and eight that show no difference. Um, and I'm glad to say that none of the studies show that psychotherapy kills patients, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, we've recently completed a meta-analysis of this, and we see an overall effect size of psychotherapy for cancer survival. There have been seven meta-analyses on this question so far. Three of them show an effect, four of them don't, um, and we're, we're now understanding some of the reasons for the differences, different samples, different ways of analysis, uh, different criteria for admitting studies. And so we're, we're working on a paper on that issue now. But it, it certainly raises the possibility that doing good psychotherapy with cancer patients, the brain can affect the body and help them live longer. So how might that be? What are some of the mind-body variables that could account for this? We've been working on that for many years. Um, and we think circadian rhythm disruption, uh, HPA activity, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system activity, immune system, and even telomere shortening may be factors in this. Uh, one study uh, by Linda Carlson uh, in Canada, Calgary, uh, showed that our supportive expressive group therapy actually slows shortening of telomeres uh, in cancer patients. Um, we were very interested in circadian rhythms. Uh, there is, uh, the World Health Organization has determined that nighttime shift work is a probable carcinogen, and so having your circadian rhythms disrupted may have an effect on disease. 
Um, here you see a normal circadian variation in cortisol. Here you see the elevation and loss of circadian variation in depression. And in post-traumatic stress disorder, you see lower um, and flatter cortisol levels than you see in normals. What we found is that in our samples of women with metastatic breast cancer, those who had the more normal circadian variation that is high in the morning and low late in the day lived significantly longer over the ensuing 10 years than those who had a flatter aberrant cortisol pattern. So disruption of circadian cortisol uh, is a factor that can contribute to cancer death. And we've seen this now um, in uh, lung cancer as well. And it's been shown in GI cancers and about four different cancers that loss of circadian variation in cortisol predicts shorter survival. Um, one reason may be that cortisol actually inhibits the expression of normal BRCA1, which is a tumor suppressor gene. And so having aberrant patterns and having high cortisol when you shouldn't uh, may actually inhibit the uh, cell suicide mechanisms that keep aberrant cells from replicating. Um, we found also that the aberrant cortisol slope was associated with sleep disruption, as you might expect. It's another circadian function. Um, and uh, Oksana Polish in our group, uh, using wrist actigraphy, showed that um, sleep efficiency predicted longer survival with breast cancer. So those who had fewer awakenings during the night lived significantly longer uh, over the ensuing eight years than those who had multiple awakenings during the night. And again, this isn't just a pre-death event where you're not sleeping well shortly before you die. This predicts survival years later. Um, we found that sleep uh, affects vagal activity. So you all know that if you're really, you get a nasty email at 11 o'clock at night, you don't know what to do, you're struggling with it, you finally wisely go to sleep. And in the morning, you just figure it out and do it. It takes you like two minutes. Um, that's in part because sleep is governed by vagal parasympathetic activity and reduced sympathetic activity. And those who sleep better have more vagal tone in the morning. So it's a self-soothing ability that our brains have for our bodies that allows us to handle stressors in a much uh, calmer way, as is often taught in mindfulness, and I will get to that in a few minutes. One of the ways of measuring vagal tone is heart rate variability. It's the tendency for heart rate to change with inspiration and expiration. Steve Porges and others have demonstrated this. And we found that higher overall heart rate variability, that is more vagal tone, is another independent predictor of survival with breast cancer. Um, so there are a number of these mind-body uh, uh, psychophysiology issues that can actually affect cancer survival. Um, another one is sympathetic nervous system activity, and this is a group published a very interesting paper in Nature Medicine showing that noradrenergic activity stimulates the production of, uh, of uh, tumor of, of uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, which can provide a, a blood vessel supply for metastatic tumors. You know, there are a lot of tumors in the body that never do anything, they just sit there, but some escape and can trigger a blood supply that will allow them to grow, and those are the ones that can kill you. Sympathetic activity triggers uh, the production of a vascular bed for tumor cells, and if you block it with a beta blocker, for example, or with short inhibitory RNA, you can block the development of this vascular growth that can support tumor growth in an animal model. And somebody got the brilliant idea of seeing whether that might work in humans. Could beta blockers actually block tumor growth? And this is a paper a few years ago in Journal of Clinical Oncology showing that patient, breast cancer patients who happen to be on propranolol, mostly for blood pressure regulation, um, actually lived longer than those who were not receiving propranolol. There have been several studies now showing that the use of a beta blocker may actually affect survival time with cancer as well. So the idea is that there are many ways to help patients survive better, to go from feeling damaged and disrupted to someone who is transcendent. When you look at the wing victory of Samothrace in the Louvre, you don't think, my, there's a woman who's missing her arms and her head. You see it as an image of transcendence, and that's what we try to help our cancer patients do. The idea is that they can handle the stressor better by facing rather than fleeing, altering their perception of their problems like pain and also of their situation. Learn to cope actively, find something you can do about whatever it is that's troubling you, expressing emotion, and seeking social support. So in the last part of the talk, I want to just address the symptom control issues we use involving 
hypnosis because if the brain has this kind of effect on the body, there are a lot of things we can use the brain to do. And I think one of the sad things is that in psychiatry we have equated science uh, with a bottom-up biological uh, intervention on parts of the brain rather than seeing how we can use the machine as a whole to better regulate and manage our body. Um, this is my daughter's depiction of what I do. She says my dad hypnotizes people and makes them want to live longer. And you see a particularly successful clinical example uh, here. Now, Julia graduated Yale Law School about four years ago, and she says to me, Dad, are you still using this drawing? And I say to her, yes, I am, but I have to tell you that it does not represent her current level of artistic ability. <laughs> uh, so hypnosis is the oldest Western conception of a psychotherapy. It's the first time that a talking interaction was thought to have therapeutic potential. It began in Vienna with Franz Anton Mesmer. You've all heard the term mesmerize. Um, he was inducing these altered mental states in subjects. They seemed to get better. And as soon as he got a reputation there, he left his wife and family in Vienna and moved to Paris, um, where he was competing very effectively with the leading French physicians of the day. Now, if you did a randomized trial and sent every other medically ill patient to Mesmer versus a French physician, how many think Mesmer's patients would have gotten better? How many think the French physician's patients would have done better? Oh, come on. You can guess, can't you? Well, Voltaire wrote a letter to his brother. He said, we did everything we could to save father's life. We even sent the doctors away. And um, <laughs> think about it. What was the major treatment in 18th century France? Blood leeches. France was the world's leading exporter of leeches, bloodletting. So unless you happen to have congestive heart failure or polycythemia vera, you were more likely to be killed in health by going to a doctor. So Mesner, if he just kept people away from doctors, uh, he would probably do better. This did not endear him to the, Fre the French medical community. And so they investigated Mesmer. They decided that what hypnosis was was, quote, nothing but heated imagination, which is probably true, but at the time it was a devastating conclusion. The members of the commission were very interesting. Our own Benjamin Franklin, you now have Franklin College. I hear it has something to do with somebody from Philadelphia um, uh, here. Franklin was there on the commission. So maybe this is why they named the college after him, John. I don't know. Um, there was the brilliant chemist Lavoisier um, uh, on the panel, and also a doctor well known for his work in pain control, Dr. Guillotin, the inventor of the guillotine. He, he kind of created the mind-body problem. <laughs> and uh, so this commission concluded it was nothing but heated imagination, and it was the end of Mesmer's career. But it won't go away, and I think of hypnosis as something like the oldest profession. Everybody's interested in it, but nobody wants to be seen in public with it. So I'm here in public. He used to call it animal magnetism, and there are risks to animal magnetism. I'm, I'm here to warn you. Um, Sigmund Freud started his career um, studying hypnosis with the, the brilliant French neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot. And uh, Freud's, if you read the studies in hysteria, he's doing hypnosis. And um, the couch in his original study was there for hypnotic inductions. And Freud, in his autobiography, wrote that one day I was relieving a patient of her attacks of pain by tracing them back to their traumatic origins in hypnosis when she suddenly threw her arms around my neck. He said, the unexpected entrance of a manservant relieved us from a painful discussion. I was modest enough not to attribute this event to my own irresistible personal attractiveness. <laughs> and that was the moment that Freud discovered transference. And he decided that to not take advantage of the transference but understand it better, he had to stop doing hypnosis. He moved his chair behind the couch because he didn't like patients staring him in the eye and started having them free associate. So that was the beginning of psychoanalysis. It was all started with hypnosis. Um, this is his last study. The first study in, in Vienna had an archaeological dig in the sacred spot over the couch, which makes sense because he was interested in deeper and deeper layers of unconscious material. This was his last study, which he saw to the arrangement of. 
And in the sacred spot over the couch was no longer an archaeological painting. It was Charcot demonstrating hypnotic catalepsy. And he wrote at the end of his career that he thought that the pure gold of analysis might have to be alloyed with the baser metal of suggestion. And I think Freud was right at that point. Many of his followers did not. But there's much we can learn from this ability to focus attention and control how our brain controls our body. So there are three major components to hypnosis. One is highly focused attention. It's like getting so caught up in a good movie or a play that you forget you're watching a movie. You become part of the movie rather than the audience. Uh, hypnosis has been likened to looking through a telephoto lens in a camera. What you see, you see with great detail, but you're less aware of the context. And that allows you to be more flexible in the way in which you experience the event in, focus, in the focus of your attention. That's been called absorption. And there are studies now that show that people who are, have more self-altering events get absorbed in a sunset or a movie turn out to be more highly hypnotizable than those who don't. In order to do that, you have to put outside of conscious awareness things that are ordinarily in consciousness. So there's a movable boundary of consciousness. Right now, for example, you're having sensations in your bottoms touching these wonderful chairs. Hopefully that was not foremost in your mind until I brought it to your attention. If it was, you're free to leave now. Um, <laughs> In order to pay attention to one thing, you have to put other things that could be in your attentional circle out of awareness. And people do that extremely well in hypnosis. We call it dissociation. The third, and perhaps the part that scares people the most, is suggestibility, the idea that the hypnotist can make you do anything they want. Um, when patients used to anxiously ask my father about that, he would say to them, um, if that were true, do you think I would be wasting my time sitting here with you? Um, which converted anxiety into anger, but it did change the perspective. So, in fact, people tend to go along. We've all had this, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time experience in life. We are social creatures. We're subject to social influence. That's part of how psychotherapy works. Jerry Frank's book, uh, Persuasion and Healing, that's a lot of what we do in therapy. Um, but in hypnosis, you can use it. Uh, to help people change their perspective on their pain, their habit problems, uh, their memories of a traumatic event, uh, and that can be a tremendous asset. But what it does mean is patients in hypnosis are less likely to correct your mistakes. Um, so you need to think very carefully about what you say to people and how you say it to them. Another very important concept is that hypnotizability is a stable trait. So in the human lifespan, most eight-year-olds are in trances most of the time. You know that if you call them in for dinner, they don't hear you. They're off doing what they do. But we, some of us lose that ability as we enter young adulthood. And it is as stable as IQ over a 25-year interval um, in adult life. So the test-retest correlation for hypnotizability is 0.7. So it means it's a very fixed and stable trait. Two-thirds of the adult population are at least somewhat hypnotizable. About 10% of them are extremely hypnotizable, and there are a third of adults who just aren't. So what we do is start testing for hypnotizability. It's a five-minute test called the hypnotic induction profile. It teaches the patient about their ability. It teaches me about their ability. And I'm not trying to talk them into something. I'm doing what I do in any other part of my examination. I'm learning about the patient and how they respond. Um, we found that hypnotizability is correlated with homovanillic acid levels in the cerebrospinal fluid about 0.6, so clearly dopaminergic activity is involved in hypnotizability. Uh, I had a patient come in the other day saying, I'm heterozygous for the COMT methionine valine site. Um, I think I'm probably pretty hypnotizable, and she was right. Um, and she said, my husband is the opposite of me, and I'm sure he's homozygous, but um, it turns out that the heterozygotes have more figure ground flexibility in perception and they turn out to be more highly hypnotizable than homozygotes for this gene in the dopamine metabolism pathway. Um, we then recently did an fMRI study uh, in collaboration with uh, the Gabriellis, who are now at MIT, uh, and a number of colleagues at Stanford, and we recruited 12 high and 12 low hypnotizable subjects, uh, examined functional connectivity in the three, three of the major networks, salience, default mode, and executive control network. And what we found was a significant difference in the functional connectivity between the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the dorsal anterior cingulate in high hypnotizables but not in lows. So um, what this relationship means, we think, is consistent with hypnotic absorption, that if you have 
uh, connectivity between the executive control network, what you're thinking about or doing, and the ACC, the salience network, which is telling you whether you should be worrying about doing something else, you're more likely to get absorbed. So that connectivity, we think, explains the ability for highly hypnotizable people to spontaneously get engaged. Um, more recently, we asked a related but different question. Uh, what happens um, when uh, you hypnotize people in the scanner? And uh, we, were, we screened 545 students, mo mostly students as subjects, found 36 extreme highs and 21 extreme lows. And we found three major findings related to hypnosis. One is reduced activity in the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. In highs, we had four conditions, rest, memory control condition, and two hypnotic experiences, one involving imagining feeling really happy, another involving a vacation. And you see that when they did that, they turned down activity in the dorsal anterior cingulate. And the more hypnotized they felt, the less activity they experienced in the dorsal anterior cingulate. Um, the second, very interesting, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, high functional connectivity with a different part of the salience network, the insula. The insula helps to regulate mind-body control and is part of the pain network as well. So it helps us to understand how hypnotizable and hypnotized people can do so well in controlling their somatic function. And the third is inverse connectivity between the DLPFC and the default mode network, medial prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate cortex. That's a mechanism for dissociation. The more engaged you are, the less you're reflecting on yourself and what you're doing and what it means that you're doing it. So we think we now have some understanding of how the brain mobilizes itself under hypnosis, and it helps to account for many of the major phenomena we have in hypnosis. This was uh, published last summer in Cerebral Cortex. So what I thought I'd do now, if you'd like, is give you a little experience of self-hypnosis, if you want, just to see what I try to teach my patients to do. If any of you don't want to do it, just sit there with your eyes open and smile at your friends, but let's uh, give it a try. So get as comfortable as you can. All right, now on one, do one thing, look up, all the way up, high as you can, way up, two, do two things. Keep looking up, but slowly close your eyes, and three, do three things. Let your eyes relax, but keep them closed. Let your breath out, and let your body float. Imagine you're floating somewhere safe and comfortable, like a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or just floating in space, each breath deeper and easier. And notice how quickly and easily you can use your store of memories and fantasies to help yourself and your body feel better. If you happen to have any discomfort, imagine that the part of your body that hurts is warmer or cooler or tingling or numb. And let this other sensation filter the hurt out of the pain. Each breath deeper and easier. Body floating. Now picture in your mind's eye an imaginary screen. It could be a movie screen or a TV screen or a piece of clear blue sky. And picture on it a pleasant scene. And notice again how you can use your stored memories and fantasies to help yourself and your body feel better. Now please divide the screen in half and on the left side picture one thing that's caused you stress today but with the rule that no matter what you see on the screen, you keep your body floating. This is your problem, not your body's. And allow yourself to feel whatever emotion is stirred up by this thing that is causing you stress. And then use the right side of the screen as your brainstorming or problem-solving screen. Think of one thing you could do to address the stressor on the other side. All right, now take a few moments to reflect on what this means to you in a private sense, and then when you're ready, bring yourself out of the state of self-hypnosis by counting backwards from three to one. On three, get ready. Two, with your eyelids closed, roll up your eyes, one open. Ready, three, two, one. How's everybody feeling? I haven't lost anybody, I trust. All right, well, We'll go on. It's interesting, after the hypnosis, there's always a moment of sort of comfortable silence where people don't particularly feel like saying anything, but I think they feel somewhat soothed and, and comfortable. And if, 
you have any questions or comments about it, we can discuss it uh, in a few minutes in the discussion section. Um, so how do we use it in medical care, and what are the results of doing that? Um, we, uh, I had a colleague uh, who was sort of skeptical about hypnotic alteration of perception, so he said, uh, I study imagery, why don't we see whether you don't just shut your brain down with hypnosis, you actually change what you perceive. So we gathered some highly hypnotizable subjects. Um, we used PET to identify blood flow in brain regions associated with looking at color versus looking at black and white. And then I hypnotized them and um, had them change their color perception, either drain color from the color grid or add color to the black and white grid like you're seeing here. And what we found was that those uh, who were looking at black and white but thought it was color increased blood flow in the color processing regions. And those who were looking at color but thought it was black and white decreased blood flow. So I call this my believing is seeing experiment. When you use hypnosis to alter perception, you don't simply process one thing and then imagine it's something else. You change how you perceive it. And if you think about our perceptual apparatus, it's always a match between raw input and memory expectation pattern recognition in the brain. And so it's possible to change what you perceive by changing your expectation of what it is. And that's what we saw here. Believing is seeing. Um, uh, this was an early study I did using somatosensory event-related potentials. We took 12, 10 highly hypnotizable subjects. The red line is a normal somatosensory evoked response to a series of shocks being administered. Um, and the yellow line, same shocks, same subjects, but now they're hypnotized and told your hand is cool, tingling, and numb. And what you see here is that the P100 just disappears. Now this is a tenth of a second after the stimuli are administered. So the brain is just acting as though it's not receiving the input, and the P2 and P3, which you might expect would also be changed, were only half as big. So the brain is acting as though it is not perceiving to the same extent the shocks. Uh, this is work by Pierre Rainville at the University of Montreal, showing that just the words you say changes the part of the brain that gives you hypnotic analgesia. So if you tell them, as I did in that prior experiment, your hand is cool, tingling, and numb, you get hypnotic analgesia, but the site of the analgesia is somatosensory cortex, which kind of makes sense. If you do the same thing, but what you say is, well, the pain is there, but it won't bother you, the way many people feel on opiates, you get analgesia, but now it's not somatosensory cortex, it's the dorsal anterior cingulate that turns down activity. So you can change the part of the brain that responds and gives you analgesia. Um, and we know that pain is a bidirectional process, that there's a phenomenon called central pain, Normally, the pain signals come up through the lateral spinothalamic tract, through the periaqueductal gray into somatosensory cortex. But there is top-down regulation of pain, too, as you can see here. I think you can see the uh, baby is the one getting the shot. <laughs> it looks kind of interested, don't you think? And the father is the one who's in pain. So we can use that. And what we do is teach people to float the way I was asking you to, to experience. Um, imagine them to dissociate, go somewhere else. I have highly hypnotizable subjects who say when they're in the dentist's office, they just go take a vacation, and the dentist has more pain than they do because he hasn't given them Novocaine and they're fine. Or sensory alteration, warmth or coolness, tingling, numbness. Imagine a different experience, one sometimes that you physically do to relieve the pain. Uh, this was a randomized trial we did with patients undergoing percutaneous arterial catheterization for chemoembolization and other reasons. These patients are not given general anesthesia. They are given patient-controlled analgesia. And we had three conditions, standard care where they could just press a button and get opiates, um, structured attention where they had a supportive nurse with them, or training in self-hypnosis. And what you see is that the first hour didn't make that much difference, but by the end of two hours, the average pain ratings were a little above one in the hypnosis group and they were five in the standard care group. These are the anxiety ratings. Uh, I was afraid the hypnosis group had died because they had no anxiety at all <laughs> at two hours. It was four and a half in the uh, standard care group. And the standard care group was using twice as much opiates as the hypnosis group. And you know, think about the opiate problem in this country. 33,000 people a year die from opiate overdose. We are the pushers, doctors. There is a need for non-pharmacologic analgesia that we have barely touched the surface of. Patients who are on opiates for more than three days, the addiction curve starts going like this. 
there are now lawsuits. There's one in Ohio now suing Purdue and some of the other companies because they told doctors that op these opiates aren't addicting. Well, they are, and in fact, people in pain are more likely to get addicted than people who aren't. We were taught the opposite when I was in medical school. But in pain, you have this rebound algesia when you try to get off the opiate. So you have dysphoria, hyperalgesia, and you get respiratory suppression as well. And sadly, you don't develop tolerance to the respiratory depression of opiates, but you do develop tolerance to the euphorogenic effects and the analgesic effects. So that's why people accidentally overdose. That's why we lost Prince and a lot of other people, because they don't realize that the respiratory depression is what's likely to kill them. The uh, average procedure duration, you may have noticed that this is a shorter line. It's not because they died. It's because they got done 17 minutes quicker on average, because there were fewer complications uh, by far in the hypnosis group than in the standard care group. So we actually saved $338 a procedure, including the extra person in the room by doing this. Now, if I had a drug that did this, every hospital in the United States would be using it. But you know, there's no, no industry to push the product unless people who make dangling watches you know, would want to do it. So we have a real problem in disseminating this. Uh, this is the early acupuncture for pain control. <laughs> Um, does it work in chronic pain, cancer pain? Yes. So in that same randomized trial, we taught people self-hypnosis for pain control. And what you see here is that by the end of the year, the patients in our support groups had half the pain the control group did on the same and very low amounts of medication. And we replicated that finding as well in our follow-up study 15 years later. Um, I'm going to skip that. I want to mention one other use of hypnosis that is particularly salient to um, to uh, cancer care, and that is teaching people self-hypnosis to stop smoking. We have a single session treatment in which we teach people not to focus on not liking the taste of cigarettes. Tom Hackett taught me to use hypnosis at Mass General, and his first approach was to teach people that c cigarette smoke tasted like horse shit, and this guy would come out of the hypnosis and smoke it, and say, oh, that's terrible. But Tom got an urgent call two hours later. He said, my house smells terrible. <laughs> And Tom said, well, are you smoking? And he said, no, but I didn't tell you that my wife smokes. So he had to be rehypnotized that with only his cigarette. It's not the way to do it. What you do is you focus on your commitment to respect and protect your body. For my body, smoking is a poison. I need my body to live. I owe my body respect and protection. So you focus on what you're for, not what you're against. Uh, and here's the outcome. Um, half the patients we treated this way stopped smoking uh, initially. And half of them did not touch a cigarette in two years. Single cigarette, they were considered a failure. So we got one out of four long-term abstinence from a single session of self-hypnosis. So this is another example. There are a lot of medications that are being used. That, you know, the repackaged bupropion doesn't help very much at all. There are ways of teaching people to use their brain to better respect their body. Finally, I want to take a moment to talk about hypnosis and meditation. I know you're doing some terrific research here on that. There are similarities and differences. Meditation is packaged differently. It's Eastern, so the general idea is you don't use it to solve a problem that's too Western and problem-focused. It's a, w a different way of being. And you traditionally, John Kabat-Zinn's approach to half an hour twice a day. But there are similarities. Absorption is something like the focused attention, the body <laughs> scan you do in mindfulness. Dissociation is something like the open presence. You don't want to be an actor in your experience. You just want to let things flow by. You surf the emotion is one of the concepts. And suggestibility is somewhat like the compassion training that you get in uh, mindfulness, although I think there are real differences too. Uh, and here Hedy Kober has published uh, a number of excellent papers on mindfulness, including this one showing uh, differences in default mode uh, network activity, reduced activity in the default mode network related, I think, to dissociation and somewhat similar uh, to what we saw in the inverse functional connectivity between the LPFC and the default mode. So I think we will be learning, we're studying it too, similarities and differences between mindfulness uh, and uh, hypnosis. And I think at uh, Hetty's work, we were talking at dinner last night, is getting shorter and shorter, more and more focused. So I think you're moving mindfulness in the direction of hypnosis, which makes me happy. And I'm hopefully we'll find an overlap that will be a very useful tool for patients uh, in dealing with a number of these symptoms. There are other things about mindfulness. Richie Davidson has shown uh, 
unusual activity in the left frontal cortex, which tends to elevate mood. So there are some brain imaging differences as well, but there are also similarities. So I hope there'll be a convergence of east and west in using our brain better to deal with the issues of our body. So in summary, there are many ways that we can use um, support, uh, techniques like hypnosis and mindfulness, uh, helping people to sleep better, normalizing their circadian rhythms like cortisol rhythms, um, help, making sure that they have adequate social support. And one of the things we found in our meta-analysis on survival is that patients who are unmarried got more benefit from the groups than those who are married, which makes sense. You're providing social support they don't otherwise have and treating depression as well as normalizing sympathetic and parasympathetic balance as well. All of these are things we can do to use our brains to help our bodies. Um, I want to acknowledge our research support, the National Institute on Aging, National Cancer Institute, National Center for Complementary Integrative Health, uh, NIMH, you saw this, the slide here, and boy, is this salient today, right? Um, uh, I'm hoping that the NIH budget will uh, remain uh, as it is. It seems to be one of the few things that Republicans and Democrats actually agree on, thank God. And your president, Dr. Salovey, and ours, Mark Tessier Levine, were in Washington last week talking to senators, particularly Republican senators. President Salovey last night said to me, I can usually get an interview with any Republican who went to Yale. So uh, he's working on people who might be on the fence, and hopefully we will be able to maintain NIH uh, budget support. Uh, these are many of the people who over the years have helped uh, our work. There's Oksana Polish, uh, Janine D.C. Davis, who did the vagal uh, activity uh, study, Heather Abercrombie studied, uh, at, she's at the University of Wisconsin now studying uh, salivary cortisol, and many other people. And I want to thank the patients who have taught us so much about what we're doing. But finally, remember that the mind-body problem is nothing to mess around with. He's saying, what happened here, Sergeant? He said, it's a placebo overdose. We're pretty sure he only thinks he's dead. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Yes,